Hello everybody and welcome to the first part of building my 32 Ford Roadster. Over the past two and a half years, I fully mocked up the car behind me, took it all apart, did a quick rattle can epoxy paint job on it. If you're out there and looking at building a hot rod one day or you're currently starting your build, this video is going to kind of give you the fundamentals of what to look out for if you're out shopping, swap meets, internet surfing, whatever it may be. This is not going to be a step-by-step -step video by any means. It's really me just sharing the information, the stuff that I learned, again, the fundamentals to hopefully give you the confidence and a little bit more knowledge to have a successful hot rod build. Many of the clips that you already saw, a lot of those clips are on Instagram right now. You can go over to enye underscore garage. That's spelled E-N-E underscore garage, where you can see this car being built pretty much step-by-step, -step, all on Instagram stories. There's currently four parts, and we'll probably likely get to part five towards the tail end of this video. So financially, one of the most efficient ways to start your hot rod build is by buying a blank slate chassis. What I mean by that is buying a chassis where the cross members are already fully welded in. All you have to do is drop in your front suspension and your rear suspension. So if you're out online shopping or at your local swap meet, here's what you need to know about shopping for a chassis. The critical things are really in your X frame and your rear cross member. The simple one is your front cross member. Most all front cross members are going to accept the traditional leaf spring, unless you want to run an A-arm suspension, but we're not really going to talk about that here. Moving on to your center cross member, here's how it affects your build. Really, the main thing you're looking for is how are you going to set up your pedal assembly, your brake, and your clutch if you're running a manual transmission. Some manufacturers like Brookville or TCI, they already sell a nice pedal assembly that will bolt right on. But if it is a custom built frame, you want to just see if there's already a flat plate installed for you to mount your master cylinder. Is there going to be enough room for your brake lever and your clutch lever? Those kind of things. Now, the more critical of all cross members is the rear. When you're shopping for your chassis, you're going to want to see what kind of rear cross member it has. And you're really going to get two options. Is it going to accept coilovers or a buggy rear spring? Let's get into the actual rear suspension that further explains whether you're running a coilover or a buggy rear spring. Starting with the most traditional approach, that's going to be what they call the buggy rear lead spring. And then you use gas filled shocks. Now that is definitely the most traditional approach. It looks beautiful, especially if you're going to be running a really nice rear end, like a winner's quick change. A Model A's where you don't have that gas tank in the back like a 32, it really sets the kind of the rear end and the way it looks. Now the rear buggy springs, you can hold on your rear end in a few different ways as well. The most traditional approach is your original wishbone. It literally comes straight from the axle, meets in the center. Then you have your split wishbones. Then from there, you have your ladder bars. There's a few other options in between, but those are your three critical things. The main drawback towards a rear buggy spring versus coilovers is coilovers, you have a lot more adjustment. In the market today, you have coilovers where you can adjust your dampening through the turn of a knob. You can change your spring to different spring rates. You can raise or lower the right height by adjusting the collars. One of the other major drawbacks to a buggy rear spring is your exhaust system. It is a pain to get your exhaust system to go through the X-frame, nice and tight to the ladder bars and somehow over your axle. And then from there, you can't really go to the side. So you're kind of either gonna shoot straight down or go underneath the tank. So as you're Googling these things, check out the exhaust as well, because the rear suspension is really gonna set you up for what type of exhaust system you're gonna be able to do. When it comes to coilovers, you really have two different options. You have a parallel four link bar, which also uses a panhard bar in order to keep that rear end center at all times. Your last and final option is a triangulated four link. Your bottom two bars are parallel and your upper bars are triangulated and that triangle is what keeps your rear end nice and center. That's the setup that I went with. Ultimately, in my opinion, the rear four link is the most versatile. It also uses the least amount of parts. Less parts means less things you have to maintenance down the road. And it also leaves the center of the car really exposed for your future exhaust system. Again, it's totally up to you. There's pluses and minuses to any decision you make. What you need to know is that your rear suspension really sets you up for what type of exhaust work you're going to need to do in the future. 
The only thing really left is your front setup. Now, in the front, you're more than likely going to run a solid I-beam axle, unless you run A-arm stuff. We're not really going to go that route. It's a little bit too modern, a little too street rod for probably what this crowd is doing. But for a solid axle, it's really simple. If you're going to go out and start shopping, especially at your swap meets, here's what you're looking for. The first thing is, is it straight? If it's a used axle, stare down the middle of it and make sure there's no waves or anything weird like that. Other than that, you have three critical things when buying an axle. The most critical one is your drop. Most axles are either stock or anywhere from one inch to five inch normally max of a drop. And that of course is gonna affect the way that your car sits. The second critical thing that you're looking for in a front axle is its width. This kind of really affects the overall front visual of your car. There's really two main sizes, but there is some in-betweeners out there, especially on the early aftermarket stuff. So there's a total of about four to five different sizes. Lastly, the axle height. You usually have two inch or two and a quarter. That really doesn't matter. It only affects your radius rods. Speaking of radius rods, let's get into those next. The radius rods are critical to your front suspension, and it's also critical to the way your car looks. The most traditional approach is using the original wishbone. Then you have your split bones, which is kind of what I'm running here. And then from there, you have what's called a hairpin, and those use normally hive joints to a bat wing. And then the most modern approach is going to be your four-link bar in the front. The hairpin approach and the four-link bar do have some performance advantages, some handling advantages. You can look into those and Google and research that. Now, whether you're looking for parts or just looking for awesome content, always feel free to head over to calirod.com. I try to update that weekly with new content, new parts that we're going to be selling. And my whole goal with that is to really use modern ways, modern technology to really keep our traditional hot rods alive. Next time we talk, we're going to talk about how to actually set up your suspension, how to tack everything in, how to make sure everything's level and square. So please stay tuned. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.